So here's the lateral ventricles here. Um, uh, and this is kind of a cast of the ventricular system. <clears throat> Paired lateral ventricles, and we won't go into all their substructures, but uh, suffice it to say, these are <clears throat> odd in their shape. They're predictable if anybody has an interest in embryology. If you look at the closure and the folding of the neural tube, it's quite dramatic. They communicate into the third ventricle by way of the foramina of Monroe on both sides. And through the foramen of Monroe, I mean, through the third ventricle, through the aqueduct of Silvius into the fourth ventricle, and then out of the fourth ventricle through three outlet foramina, uh, the midline aperture and the, the paired lateral apertures of Lushka, uh, then into the spinal and brain subarachnoid space. <clears throat> and you see this, uh, I don't know if this right. you see this here in this uh, illustration, production within the CSF ventricular compartment through the lateral ventricle into the third, through the aqueduct fourth, then into the subarachnoid space. We're going to talk about these areas in a moment. Um, this, this video that's playing here off to the right shows you, and it, and it shows beautifully, and this, uh, not just idea, but this practical idea. Uh, this is demonstrating velocity of flow. I believe this is through the aqueduct of Silvius, as interpreted through some uh, MR imaging uh, tools that can, sequences that can be used. So you're looking at velocity in forward and backward directions. What becomes readily obvious is it's not unidirectional. So, you know, we always show these cartoons with these, with these arrows, but really what's happening is this to and fro motion anywhere, be it the ventricle or the aqueduct, that's happening in a, in a, in a constant, constant way. The net flow is a unidirectional, but because of a lot of factors that uh, we'll mention, uh, it's not limited to one direction of flow. Uh, obviously, an anatomical specimen here. Uh, I really, I just point out a couple of things here. Uh, the outlet chambers, you know, which are extremely small relative to the capacity of the volume of fluid they need to take hold of. You know, if you see these in real time, these apertures, uh, Mejendi and Lushka, they're really measured in millimeters. Uh, likewise, the aqueduct, the normal diameter is about two to three millimeters in a non-pathologic state. Doesn't take much to block those off. So whether it be protein debris, blood, bacterial infection, inflammatory changes, tumor cells, uh, these get blocked off quite readily. So the other component of uh, you know, the, the circulatory pattern at the, uh, at the other end is the they call the transventricular, and then into the subarachnoid space. <clears throat> now, this becomes a, another very, very important mechanism from the standpoint of homeostasis, that when the CSF exits uh, the ventricular system through those outlet foramen of the fourth ventricle, they gain access into the subarachnoid space, then into these outpouchings that I'll show you some illustrations of called arachnoid villi. And if you've done your gross anatomy lab already, when you strip open the dura, a lot of times you'll see these what look like milky arachnoid uh, calcifications that are kind of stuck to the dura. Those are actually arachnoid granulations, which are, think of them as small arachnoid mushrooms pushed into the dural venous sinuses, where that transmission of fluid takes place on the absorptive side. Um, then into the bloodstream through the deep venous sinuses, the sagittal transfer sigmoid sinuses, all those large sinuses, you've got this nearly free flow of fluid from the subarachnoid space into the bloodstream via venous outflow. As I mentioned before, there are compensatory mechanisms. Uh, you know, really hot right now are the lymphatics with regard to a real lymphatic circulatory process in the brain. These are usually around things like the cranial nerves through ostia and the cranial base. And you will see this, and, uh, and I remember very well when I was a, a resident, not believing a mother when her kid came in with a shunt malfunction that she said his, his eyes look swollen. And I thought she was crazy, but clearly there are uh, lymphatic, glial lymph, uh, lymphatic systems as well as those in the perivascular area and, and you know, perineural area that will force CSF through them in a, in a state of uh, a need or comp compensation. Um, you know, on the absorptive side, unlike the production side, this becomes really important, again, from the standpoint of uh, manipulation, what the clinician can do, is this uh, resorptive aspect between the sinus and the subarachnoid space. This is a sagittal view of the brain, inner hemispheric fissure, the bone. So here's your dural sinus, uh, your meninges split into two different layers. And you see these little outpouchings or what I was referring to as mushrooms of arachnoid tissue that really dive into the, the venous sinus where that transmission of flow and fluid takes place. This is what I was describing before in the gross lab. It looks like 
chalky debris, but these are very enriched arachnoid granulations around the sinuses. Um, and, and this is really governed not by energy, but one of a very simple pressure differential. That if you increase the pressure in the venous sinus, you're going to decrease the absorptive capacity in the subarachnoid space and vice versa. It's a very simple method from the standpoint of uh, resorptive capacity of the CSF that has very, very important aspects on the clinical side that we'll talk about and some are highlighted here. So to increase resorptive capacity, just based on what I said, if you have decreased intravenous pressure, uh, you likely will absorb more CSF at a higher rate and uh, same thing in the subarachnoid space. Uh, examples would be someone with a compression around the neck or something occluding the superior vena cava as far as increasing venous pressure, transmitted to the venous sinuses and not being able to absorb CSF as readily. So manipulation of the vascular volume, hyperosmotic therapy, all these are designed to do this. Raising the head of the bed, very simple maneuver, decreases venous pressure, uh, and this greatly increases uh, uh, return through CSF uh, absorptive capacity. Everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.